Don't forget to subscribe to our Patreon for $2 a month. You get early access to videos, review portions, and you can pick topics for our podcast. Only $2 a month. Link in the description below. Back from vacation and I saw three movies. Why not do a three in one video talking about all three movies I saw from first movie I saw all the way to the last movie I saw. Let's get this started. So the first movie I'm going to talk about is 2023's Barbie, directed by Greta Gerwig. It stars Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling. It's the newest hot summer movie of the year, which everyone is talking about, and for good reason and everything like that. Um, with me, I didn't think it was like the greatest film of all time, what some people are saying, but Barbie is still a fun summer film. It's great to see this competition with Oppenheimer and Barbie, which my last year with Oppenheimer, you know how much I really love Barbie. So with that, with Barbie, I think it's a fun type kids movie it's a fun for the adults there's a lot of adult jokes with it that i think with barbie what makes it more appealing is that if you've grown up and you've played with barbie you know the mythos of barbie and the lore of barbie then it'll probably attract you a little bit more some of the jokes i thought was funny like the pregnant barbie didn't know that was a thing or the glow up barbie that was kind of funny um i think at times like the barbie movie just has fun with itself and it's very self-aware Although with the Barbie movie, I do feel like a lot of people are making this divisive when it doesn't really have to be. You know, it's some people are saying it's a good message, it's funny. I was saying it's too woke and wasn't that entertaining. And, you know, it, it, it was fine. It is what it is. It's a Barbie movie. What do you expect? But I definitely, it's going to be in the top 10 list for me at the end of the year. It's not going to be like number one. Probably like maybe 10 through 5 in one of those things. But I think the only negatives I have with the Barbie movie to get it off the way first would be the um, plot, runtime, and writing. The plot wasn't terrible, and it kept me invested. It wasn't anything new. Like, I kind of hypothesized that it was going to be the Fat Albert term of these characters who are either cartoons or toys. They go to the real world, and they're, like, trying to interact with the whole real world. And that's kind of what happened in, like, the second act in the movie. Because the first act is in Barbie land. Second act takes place in the human world or in the real world, and then the third act is back in Barbie land and then ends in the human world. So it's kind of like the Fat Albert treatment. And, you know, it's, it, it wasn't bad, but it just it wasn't my cup of tea. And then with the runtime of the film, it was just a bit too long. It clocks in about like an hour and 54 minutes. And while it's much shorter film than Oppenheimer, which was three hours, I do feel a lot of the film could have been trimmed down. Like a lot of extra like fat should have been trimmed to make it a bit more, maybe like an hour 40 maybe like 14 minutes could have been cut but you know it's 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 fine that that's just me to be honest with you and like a lot of the writing was a little bit iffy at times they had a lot of monologue moments and about things but i didn't really feel like it impacted the film for me it didn't really like bring the film down like the monologues like oh this movie is like no i didn't really feel that at all the writing's a bit hit or miss for me to be honest with you but with the positive with Barbie, I think the acting was great. Everyone does a great job with the roles, and we're just having fun with it. It sounds to me how to be Ryan Gosling, Margot Robbie, and Kate McKinnon. Those three had so much fun with their roles, and every time they came on screen, I absolutely loved it. I wouldn't be surprised if they try to get Ryan Gosling at an award for this. I mean, I wouldn't say, like, Oscar or anything, but maybe Golden Globe, because he had so much fun as Ken, and I loved it. Um, the production design was great. The setting of Barbie Land was very well done. Um, not only does the pink work, of course, they use Barbie physics where... You know, you're playing with your Barbie dream house and there's no water coming out the shower or there's no milk coming out the bowl. And it's, it's just funny. It's like they use the mechanics of Barbie and that's what makes it like kind of hilarious to me. I, I like that. That's like one of the old like animated movies. They used the, uh, the logic of Barbie. And that's pretty funny. I don't know why. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's funny. And like I mentioned before earlier in this review, uh, the jokes in the film actually do land. A lot of the jokes are really funny. Some are hit. Some are miss. It's kind of like the writing hit or miss, but a lot of it's kind of hit. I found myself laughing at this. A little way too harder than I thought I would be, but I had fun with it. I thought like Barbie had some really entertaining moments to it. Overall, with Barbie, I think it's just a good summer film. While it's not going to like reinvent the wheel or anything, it's not going to make you like think re retrospectively or anything like that, like you did with Oppenheimer. But I think Barbie is still a fun film, and it's a go and just turn off your brain and have fun watching it. And with that, I'm gonna give Barbie an 8.3 out of 10. So with the next two films, I have changed my rating system. Barbie was the last rating I'm going to give out of 10. The next two films are going to be letter grades, and that's going to be the rating system now on for the channel, just to make it easier and concise. So the next movie I watched was Happiness for Beginners, which is the new Netflix film 
that is directed by Vicky Wright based on the novel of the same name. Now this was like a family choice to go sit down and you know just watch the Netflix movie or anything and then we were recommended this. I said okay fine whatever. I'm a sucker for rom-coms but a lot of times I like to put on the Hallmark channels you know enjoy the classics when Harry Met Styles or when Harry Met Sally whoops coolest train wreck you name it I enjoy it. But however we're, we're blessed with rom-coms that are like not terrible but they're okay and Netflix doesn't have the best track record with their original movies, uh, Kissing Booth, 365, and Cuties. But with Happiness for Beginners, it's just okay. I think with Happiness for Beginners, it's just a nice little warm movie. If you like rom-coms, this is probably right up your alley. The acting was okay. Uh, I think the main leads of Ellie Cramp, and if I can remember correctly what his name was, <laughs> I completely forgot. The main cast of Ellie Kemper and Luke Grimes, they, they were okay for their roles, but the story is mostly just, hey, woman leaves relationship that ended badly, goes on something to help her get her groove back, meets a mutual acquaintance she's known for years and everything like that, and goes and just be like, hey, uh, I am going to uh, not like you at first, and we're not going to like each other, but it turns out the mutual acquaintance had a crush on her, and then, you know, so and so stuff like that and it's it, it's fine it's just very like you you know the formula at this point you know what's gonna happen and that's that's fine uh the comedy in the film was a little bit eh it was iffy there were some jokes i thought was funny and i was like okay that that could work but a lot of it is just kind of like eh and the runtime was a little bit long it clocks in about an hour 44 minutes but this in no shape or form should be an hour 44 minute film at most i'd say probably 90 minutes like <laughs> No, like an hour and 30 minutes, but you know. The, there is one thing I will say I liked about Happiness for Beginners that would probably make it okay to me. It's just the setting was just very, very pretty. It was good to look at. They filmed this uh, movie in upstate New York in Connecticut, like in the woods area of Connecticut. A lot of the shots they got were actually very great. And it gives like this warm fall feeling, like that fall spring feeling when you're out hiking with your friends. And I think that's a good setting to have for a rom-com like this because it gives you warm, even if you're watching in the summer, which is unnaturally hot and everything, this film gives you a nice sense of like warmness to it, like a spring feeling to it. And I, I enjoyed that. I think that's what makes Happiness for Beginners stand out to me as like an original movie on Netflix based on the book, is that the setting is really nice. Overall, while not being like sold on this film, I do feel like Happiness for Beginners is a cute film for the whole family or fans of the rom-com genre. If you're looking for something to watch on Netflix and a like second option or something, eh, give this film a watch. I'm gonna give Happiness for Beginners a C plus. And the last movie or documentary I watched was Nightmare: Becoming Cody Rhodes. This new Cody Rhodes documentary that's produced by WWE on Peacock. It's streaming in time for SummerSlam, which was last night at the time of this recording. Um, I, if you're not a I, I felt like this is my first type of documentary I did with this. I think the only other documentary film I reviewed was probably Action Park like three years ago. But this is like the first time I've reviewed a documentary film since that in. I really had fun with this. I think as a wrestling fan, I'm more enthralled to these types of stories and documentaries because I have maybe lived through it. And with Cody Rhodes, being a wrestling fan since 2008, I've kind of seen his arc from the beginning all the way to where it is now. It's a really good watch. Like, a lot of wrestling documentaries I like. I like Beyond the Mat, Dark Side of the Ring, at, like any of those. Even the wrestling movies. The Wrestler is probably one of the greatest wrestling movies of all time, and I love it. And I can't wait for the new Iron Claw movie with Zac Efron, too. But with this documentary, we get to see the full journey of Cody Rhodes, from being the blue chip prospect all the way to 2006, 2007, trying to live up to, like, the last name of Rhodes and get out of the shadow of his dad, Dusty Rhodes, um, to him going out on his own and becoming a star in the independence and his return back to WWE. This documentary clocks in an hour and 58 minutes. And this is almost two hours. And it does a great job of having you reflect on Cody's story up to this point. And it, I can say it can get a little emotional at times. Like if you are enthralled with the story, you may cry or may sniffle a bit, especially when Cody was talking about Dusty and his passing and how much it affected him a lot. That really hits you home. You're like, oh my God, it's like that, that human element to the story and I actually like awesome it's just the feeling of like Cody not being able to give the WWE championship to him and say no one can take this from you and that's really emotional and Cody gets really emotional with that in the doc and that's makes it more powerful more like a compelling narrative and it makes you like it it draws you in and I think that's just that's great but also the structure of the piece was well done with Cody 
how they transition from each period of his career. They have him walking through the desert, and he picks up a memento. So he picks up a picture of his dad with the WWE Championship. He picks up his boots. He picks up the title. He picks up. He opens the door for the Forbidden Door to go into the independent scene. So he goes through the same door to get back to WWE. That's a cool way to do a little time skip, a timeline of his career. I think that's very well done with that, and ah, I love it. But, you know, I will say the only downside of the documentary is that if you're not, like, a fan of wrestling, you may not want to watch it, and that's fine. Like, if you don't know wrestling and you really don't care, you might not, like, not be engaged in it as, like, I was or anything like that. And the runtime is almost a bit too long. It Like I had mentioned, it does clock in an hour 58 minutes, and that's almost two hours. And I know they got to cram a lot of his career into it, but just a little bit could have maybe been, like, cut out or just fed through. Like, a lot of the time, like... If maybe some of his early years, you could have just cut through that. Like when he got to WWE as a rookie, like that could be defined. But it, it takes its time, especially with Climax being um, the main event match at WrestleMania 39 this past uh, April. He had Roman Reigns and It's great to see that journey. It just can be a bit doozy and you kind of be like, yeah, I already know what happens at the end. So that, that sucks. Overall, like I mentioned before, if you're not a fan of wrestling or WWE, you may not care for this documentary. But I'll say give it a shot. It does a good job of being like engaging and very entertaining at the same time. And I'm going to give this a grade A minus. So let me know in the comments below. Did you watch any of these movies yet? Have you? What did you think of them? And what do you want to see next? Until next time, I've been Mac from Mac from Reviews. And I'll see you all in the next video. Peace. This is fun. <laughs> Hello.